Hello, everybody. Welcome to The World This Week. We'll focus this time on some burning issues, uh, such as the Iran deal and the migrant crisis in Europe. We'll also talk about technology this time, and we'll have a special guest who runs a special project. With me in the studio are Tal Shalev and Charles Biblizer of I-24 News. Uh, hello to you. Thank Let's you. start with this. The Iranians and the world need to understand that we will act decisively if we need to. So here's my message to Iran's leaders. The United States will never allow you to acquire a nuclear weapon. As president, I will take whatever actions are necessary to protect the United States and our allies. I will not hesitate to take military action if Iran attempts to obtain a nuclear weapon. Never, ever, ever in my life have I seen any transaction so incompetently negotiated as our deal with Iran. And I mean never. Now, Ted and everybody else have gone through all of the details, and we can talk about the 24 days, which is ridiculous. We can talk about the $150 billion, which, by the way, they get, even if the deal isn't approved, they get it just for going to the table. Yes, so, Charles, uh, the Iran deal is now center stage in the campaign. As it has been for a while. And here we have Trump again screaming from the rooftops against this horrible, incompetent deal. But the key with Trump is that he's finally elucidated a clear-cut policy. So while he has broken with some of his other candidates by saying that he'd work within the contours of the deal as opposed to abrogating it, he's come out very forcefully and saying that he views this as a business contract, given his business background, that has to be enforced, enforced, enforced. And he said he'll do so with the proverbial iron fist. It's very easy uh, for Hillary to find something other than emails. Well, yes, and but uh, campaign-wise, I think that was a very good move. Suddenly, everyone saw that when she's not talking about emails, Clinton is the most serious candidate around. You cannot compare the speech she gave uh, this week uh, on the Iran deal to any other speech we have heard from any other candidate on foreign policy. And Clinton is in a very delicate situation, on the, it, and that is why she termed her speech, yes, and. She is part of the deal. She is part of the legacy of the deal, and she is targeted by the Republican Party as a main contributor to the deal. So she has to, so she does take credit for what she has done, but she also needs to put a big butt and reassure Jewish voters mainly that she will be uh, working to reset relationship with Israel. And of course, her speech was recepted very warmly in the Israeli Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem, who is using this speech to show that all the claims that have been directed to Netanyahu's policy of inter, uh, intervening in the uh, American political system are actually bogus and that no uh, damage damage has been uh, uh, no damage has occurred to the relationship between Israel and the US and specifically the Democratic Party. Right. Meanwhile, Charles in the background there's the migrant crisis in Europe and it's not entirely disconnected from what we're talking about. Of course not. Uh, basically, what's happening in our region is fueling this flow of migrants into Europe. The latest is that the EU Commission has come out with a plan to resettle some 160,000. But this includes forcing migrants or countries to accept quotas of migrants, countries such as Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, the Czech Republic, who are not well off and who are not very receptive to this. I look at the whole issue on a macro level. Has Europe succeeded over the last couple of decades with its immigration policy and integrating these people into society? And a lot of critics say no. So what now? Have they elucidated some kind of other policy whereby it will be easier for them to do it? As well, they have to tackle the root cause of the problem, which is here, which is Syria, which is Afghanistan, which is Libya. And it, so far, I haven't heard much evidence to the, to the fact that they're willing to do what's necessary. Mm -hmm. and, all right. It's, uh, it's the eve of the uh, Jewish year, the new Jewish year. And we're here, uh, of course, broadcasting out of Israel. So uh, everybody around uh, here in Israel uh, is celebrating. So uh, I thought uh, you'd choose the story of the year here. What, well, think, what would that be? I think there are two stories. One is uh, Netanyahu stays king, as I like to call it, BB King. His uh, unexpected uh, um, w uh, victory in the elections against all odds. Everybody was already bidding goodbye, and he won against all odds uh, and has been 
turned since then as uh, the magician. But uh, I think on the other hand, he also had one big loss, and that is uh, the gamble he took on the Iran deal, appealing to Congress, misreading congressional politics, and uh, basically say, um, ignoring the president when in the fact at the end of the day, the president is the, is the one who defines foreign policy, not Congress. Right. More to come. Tal and Charles, thank you very much. Thousands of tech people from all over the world descended on Tel Aviv this week for the famous DLD conference where they uh, not only mingle but also try to figure out the next trends of technology. Uh, with us from there is Intel's Guy Barnier. Thank you very much, Guy. Hi, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, how is it going there uh, at DLD this year? It's going fantastic. Uh, you know, DLD is uh, the best innovation festival that we have here in the country, and uh, from an Intel perspective, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, innovation is, uh, that's what we do. So this is the right place for us to be. We're, it's yeah, great with, to be here. With many visitors from all over the world. We did. We've had uh, visitors the past two days from um, Literally all, all, all uh, corners of the world have been here visiting us. Now, Intel just came out with the newest chip called Skylake. Uh, what can you tell us about it? Yes. So Skylake, or 6th um, Gen is uh, officially the name. Basically, it's the first chip that Intel has come out that um, was made really with mobility in mind from the ground up. Um, and it's a fantastic new, new product. Uh, when you look at more performance, uh, less power, uh, the new capabilities, functions that it enables, uh, gets us much closer to our vision of having true, free from wires, uh, supporting all the applications that we have. It's a fantastic product. Where will we uh, be able to find it? Uh, you'll find it uh, all around you and everywhere, uh, coming soon to a, a store near you. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll be able to uh, buy just like you, know, you buy any PC today from uh, partners. Um, our OEM partners and uh, it'll be actually here in Israel uh, in the very, very near future. How fast is it uh, comparing to what we have now? It's, uh, it's much faster. The graphics are um, incredibly uh, much better and the power consumption is much, much less. Um, it also has better security than what we've had before and again, it supports all of our applications that we have, so it's a fantastic one. So this one is still within the famous Moore Law or not anymore? Uh, well, no, everything Intel does is uh, within Moore Law, so when we talk about Moore Law, it's putting more and more transistors on a piece of silicon, and uh, by doing that, enabling uh, more performance, less power, and everything I just said. So everything we do, uh, we're the guardians of Moore Law, and everything we do is within Moore's Law. Uh, don't you expect the technology to be even faster than that uh, in the near future? Uh, you know, we continue to develop uh, the pace that we are at, and uh, like I said, we continue to uh, develop uh, Moore's Law and putting more and more transistors on the piece of silicon. So what's next? Uh, Intel is getting into other places rather than just traditional computers and smartphones? Yeah, I mean, Intel's actually been in that space now for a while, and uh, actually that's, that's what we're showing here at DLD. So uh, in our uh, smart airport uh, booth here and the demos that we have, um, it's much more than a demo, it's really an experience. Um, you can come and you can see all the technologies that we have from perceptual computing, uh, Y gig, uh, wireless display. Uh, we have our wearables on display here as well, charging bowls. Uh, we have earbuds with Intel technology in them. Uh, we have smartwatches, uh, basis with a company that Intel uh, acquired a, a few a while back. So, so you know, what's beyond just the typical CPU that maybe people uh, recognize Intel from a, a while now. We've been be doing things way beyond that. Well, Guy Barnier at uh, DLD, thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate the time. Benjamin Patton is a documentary filmmaker with a special mission. He runs film workshops for veterans and military families coping with service-related stress. He is also the grandson of the legendary World War II General George Patton. And he joins us from New York. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, first, please tell me about this project. How and why did you start with it? Well, I have a, as you know, I come from a, a military family of, uh, you know, of many, many generations of military. And while I didn't choose to go in the military and entered the world of filmmaking instead, um, as, I, as I grew older, I, I was looking always for a way to connect my interest in filmmaking and my interest in history and my family legacy to, together. And so I came upon the idea of beginning to uh, the idea of using filmmaking as a tool 
to help veterans really cope with, with stresses and, and, and experiences they'd had in combat and in service. And it seems to tie together quite nicely. Um, I also have a background in developmental psychology. And I, I, I managed to blend all those things together into this idea, which is called the I Was There Film Workshops. And it essentially uses filmmaking as a therapeutic tool for veterans coping with uh, post-traumatic stress and other forms of, of uh, service-related stress. And the process itself uh, helps them even if the subjects uh, have nothing to do with uh, their military experience? I think it really has to do with the process. In fact, you know, one could say that this process could be valuable for anybody that had experienced some level of trauma. I think we found the military to be an important audience for us because of the you know, the, the decade that we've spent in Iraq and Afghanistan in these wars, and, and of course in Israel as well, you know, you're sort of always at the, at the combat ready. But, um, so it's really the process. I think the key to what we do, it, it revolves around two things. It revolves around story and storytelling. And we know that storytelling and, and narrative-based therapies are valuable, where a person goes back and, and comes to grips with an experience they've had by forming into a story and sharing it with others. And the, and the medium of digital video, we call it film, but it's really digital video, right. is a collaborative medium. And so the, the process of working together with other veterans that have experienced perhaps similar things and stresses uh, can be a very redemptive and a very healing process. Um, it allows them to go back into their histories and explore issues and experiences they've had on their terms. In other words, when you're the, when you're the director of a film, you get to decide who's in the film, who's behind the camera, what the characters are, what the subjects are. And, and it ends up being a very powerful process involving uh, groups of veterans, again, that have been through things that maybe they'll never be able to discuss in a conventional way, but mm -hmm. perhaps could make a film about. Can you give me some examples of the output? Sure. There, there's a huge range of them. I mean, I have, uh, uh, I remember two soldiers made a film that, um, where they both came upon the fact that they had missed their daughter's, uh, one of their daughter's birthdays in deployment, both of them. And these are two, two Hispanic soldiers that didn't know each other. And they came together and they made a film about a time machine where, they, where their, one of them was crafting a time machine out of a box and putting knobs on it and dials and things like that. And, and then toward the end of the film, and he's feverishly doing this, uh, frenetically doing it, and then toward the end of the film, the camera widens out and you see that he's not in Iraq or Afghanistan. He's sitting in his bedroom with his little daughter sitting on the bed asking him if she can go out, if he'll go out and play with her. And so it makes the point that sometimes you can get so caught up in what you've missed in the past that you miss the present. Um, that's one example. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we had a wonderful film where um, two veterans who had both been injured uh, in Iraq and were being medically retired in the military. They're American veterans. <clears throat> they were injured and had some PTSD and, and other family issues that they were struggling with. And they had a lot to say, but they weren't interested in being in a film. They were very nervous about being on camera and skeptical of the whole process. But after spending four days with them, the resulting film that they made, which I'm happy to send you, uh, was called Broken. And the characters in the film were G.I. Joe dolls. And just, just the G.I. Joe doll being shown being deployed and, and you know deployed again and then hanging on the hospital sign and eventually lying in a garbage can filled with bottles of beer and it was really a very powerful and evocative way to express their story without necessarily even exposing themselves personally yeah. you are the author of the book growing up Patton. how was it growing up a pattern correct well you know, there were pros and cons. I have to say that I, uh, on balance, though, I feel quite honored to be a member of this family. Uh, my grandfather, of course, was quite famous in World War II, and in some cases infamous, but, uh, but did a lot of good, I think, on, on balance. And, and the book is really about my father growing up in this shadow of a very, very famous father that died just a few days before my father turned 22 and hadn't even graduated from college. And uh, I remember when my father graduated from college, where I remember reading about it, um, six months after his father died, a veteran from World War II came up to him. This is in the summer of 1946, and said, "You'll never be the, the excuse me." He said, "You'll never be the man your father was, but congratulations anyway, because my father went into the same branch of the same service. He was an armored commander as well, and he went on to become very successful. Perhaps not famous for for most folks to know who he was, but he was just as highly decorated and became a two-star general, and." Um, 
and just was a wonderful guy. So, so I really wrote about his, you know, how he coped with his own legacy, and then how I was able to interpret his lessons that were passed down from his father to him and from him to me, and translate them into my life. And there were some wonderful leadership lessons that I think both of them had, some of which were well known and some of which were less well known. And mm -hmm. I tried to render those in the book in an, in an effective way so that civilians also could understand them. Benjamin Patton, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and, uh, and I hope our paths will cross again sometime. We sure hope. Thank you. And this has been The World This Week. We'll see you here next Sunday. Have a great week. <laughs>